Welcome to the first of our contemplative seminars for the season of Advent. We've called this series A Great and Mighty Wonder, as we focus on images related to the incarnation of Christ. It's particularly important to be able to meet like this at a time when a lot of us are isolated and feeling starved both of public worship and culture. Our aim is that this series will inspire contemplation and delight as we prepare for Christmas. Westminster Abbey is very grateful to the National Gallery for allowing us to use four images from their collection over these weeks. Today, as we begin our series, it's a huge privilege to welcome Professor Beth Williamson, Professor of Medieval Culture at the University of Bristol, and our very own Dean, the very Reverend Dr. David Hoyle, as we begin our Advent journey. Beth and David are now going to introduce us to the Annunciation by Fra Filippo Lippi. Beth. Thank you, Jamie. So as we've just heard, we're looking today at the Annunciation by Filippo Lippi. This was painted in Florence around 1450. Though its subject matter is sacred, Lippi's Annunciation was not made for a church. It was commissioned by the Medici family, one of the most important families in Florence for their palace in that city. Because of their great influence there, the Medici became the de facto rulers of Florence. They were also important patrons of the arts, being responsible for many major projects in the city throughout the 15th and 16th centuries. The painting before us here concerns the episode described in the first chapter of St. Luke's Gospel when the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary to announce that she was to become the mother of Christ. The Annunciation is celebrated in the church on March the 25th. This was an especially important feast in 15th century Florence. In the period when this picture was painted, the new year in Florence began not on 1st of January, as we currently celebrate it, but in March on the Feast of the Annunciation. This feast then and this image were both replete with the idea of new beginnings. Any painting of the Annunciation in 15th century Florence could have conjured for its contemporary viewers the idea of the beginning of a new year. In addition, though, the image of the Annunciation also represented the moment that God became human in the person of Jesus Christ. And therefore, it represented the beginning of the narrative of Christ's earthly life. In this network of beginnings, we can note that Advent, which started yesterday, is the beginning of the church's year. Advent, coming from the Latin Adventus, means coming. It is, of course, the season in which Christians wait for the celebration of the coming of Christ at Christmas. Therefore, an image of the Annunciation, which marks the beginning of the drama of human salvation, is an appropriate image with which to begin this series of Advent reflections. Lippi shows us the angel Gabriel coming to the Virgin Mary in what is clearly meant to be her home. We know nothing from Luke's Gospel about the location in which the Annunciation took place, so this had not always been the expected setting of the event. Some artists had shown the meeting between the angel and the Virgin taking place at a well. Others placed the Virgin in a church or chapel. By this period in Italy though, paintings usually showed the Annunciation taking place in a domestic interior or in a semi-interior space, such as a loggia or outside terrace space. Here, the Virgin is in a semi-enclosed area, tiled with marble, that is adjacent to a domestic space. We see a bedchamber behind her, equipped with typically 15th century Florentine furnishings and fabrics. The bed is decorated with inlaid intarsia work. The bedspread is velvet brocaded with gold. The seat upon which the Virgin sits is draped in a luxurious cloth also woven with gold and with decorative borders. 
This is not a simple house. The Virgin is dressed in a fashion that would have been familiar to contemporary viewers. She wears a red dress, as she invariably does in paintings of this period. The colour appears more pink here because the red lake pigment that makes up the paint has faded and become transparent over time. Over her dress, the Virgin wears a rich blue cloak with gold edging. These details of dress and furniture bring the episode into the contemporary world of smart 15th century Florentine viewers. In showing an interior that would have been familiar to the patrons and their guests, who would have seen this painting inside the Medici Palace, the artist allows the viewers of the painting to consider more effectively the implications of God coming to earth, coming into the world that the viewers inhabit. There are more details here too that bring this image into the contemporary world of 15th century Florence. At the end of the low stone wall between the angel and the Virgin, we see a carved design of a diamond ring containing three feathers, which is a Medici family device. In addition, the angel's wings are painted to represent peacock feathers, which could have had an extra resonance in the context of a painting for the Medici, since the peacock was another device used by them. These visual details that bring the Medici to mind serve to translate the Annunciation, not just into the world of 15th century Florence, but into the space of the Medici in particular. This gives that family, the most usual viewers of the painting, a frisson of involvement, a way of getting deeper into that process of identifying with the sacred narrative depicted, perhaps contemplating what it would have been like to have been present when such a momentous and unexpected event took place. In the house depicted within the painting, we can see interior, semi-interior and outside spaces. The angel kneels within an outer wall, as it were, on the Virgin's front lawn. He does not cross the low stone wall which borders the domestic space proper, which is signified by the tiles. His hand is partly raised, with the first two fingers outstretched, in a gesture that would normally indicate blessing or speaking. X-ray examination of the painting, undertaken by the National Gallery, indicates that the artist was undecided about the exact position that the angel's hands should take and that he altered them in the course of executing the painting. It has been suggested that the angel is about to raise his right hand in blessing. If this were the case, then this would suggest that the painter had wanted to focus on the beginning of the encounter between the angel and the Virgin. So let's look at that encounter for a moment. St Luke's Annunciation narrative lays out a dialogue. The angel first greets the Virgin, at which point the Virgin is disturbed. She was troubled at his saying, the King James translation of the Bible tells us. The angel reassures her and tells her not to be afraid. Then he explains that she is to bear a son. Mary asks questions as to how this can be possible since she is a virgin. The angel explains that this will be achieved by means of the Holy Spirit. Finally, the Virgin accepts God's will and says, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. If we turn from the biblical text to Lippi's pictorial version of the event, given what we see here, it seems to me more likely that we are intended to understand the angel as having already spoken rather than preparing to speak. His head is bowed. He looks still and settled, kneeling on the grass. This is in contrast to many other contemporary paintings of the Annunciation, in which painters sought to convey the angel's recent arrival by depicting him in a rather indeterminate kind of posture, still in the act of kneeling, with knees bending, but not yet on the ground. Sometimes his robes were shown swirling still in the breeze. 
but there's none of that sense of movement in Lippi's enunciation. Equally, the Virgin's bowed posture indicates her acceptance and her humility. She does not seem disquieted or confused. Rather than focusing on the moment as the dialogue between the Virgin and the angel is about to begin then, the painter is clearly choosing to focus on the moment after that dialogue. At that point in the scriptural passage, after the Virgin's final words of acceptance, the next line is, and the angel departed from her. Nothing more is said in the text about the incarnation of Christ. Lippi follows the essentials of the Bible text, but he expands upon it, giving us more to consider. Here in the picture, we get a chance to focus on what happened between the Virgin accepting her calling to be Christ's mother and the angel departing from her. In this pictorial expansion, Lippi imagines the actual moment of Christ becoming incarnate when he took flesh and began a human life. If we zoom in on the centre of the painting, we see at the top the hand of God appearing as it were out of a cloud and lower down a dove which represents the Holy Spirit. The hand is surrounded by a ring of golden dots and from the hand emanates a set of golden rays. Just like go faster stripes around a cartoon car, these rays indicate action and movement. Beneath the hand, we see a set of overlapping rings, each picked out with dots of gold. These gold rings, arranged as though they were a tunnel, represent the movement of the dove down from the hand of God to its position above the Virgin's lap. Each ring has rays that stretch up and back in the direction of the hand of God, again indicating movement away from that hand and in the direction of the Virgin. This next detail focuses on the dove. We can see a spray of dotted golden rays coming from the dove towards the Virgin. There's another similar set of rays emanating from a split in the Virgin's dress. We can understand these elements, this conversation of golden rays as it were, as expressing the actual moment of the Christ child's conception in the Virgin Mary's womb. As we heard, the angel had explained that the conception of Christ would occur by means of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, he says, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. This then is a highly charged moment and a moment which is not dwelt upon in the scriptural passage. The angel's words describe what is going to happen, but then the text doesn't tell us how it happened or when it happened, before or after the angel left the Virgin. In the painting, we actually see what the angel had called the power of the highest at work symbolized by the hand of God making an intervention on earth, sending down the dove of the Holy Spirit. And so the conception of Christ takes place. Within this deeply significant area in the painting, there's one further element that we should explore now, the book that the Virgin is holding. Just as Luke tells us almost nothing about where the Virgin was when the angel came to her, we also hear nothing about what she was doing before the angel spoke to her. However, a tradition began in the Middle Ages that the Virgin had been reading at the time of Gabriel's arrival. Very often, the position of the book within the painting invites the viewer to understand that the Virgin has indeed recently been reading it, but has just shifted her attention from the book to the angel as she hears his words of greeting and explanation. Sometimes the book is placed on a reading desk or a prayer kneeler beside the Virgin. Sometimes she still holds the book, but she's closed it. And sometimes she simply looks up from the book and meets the gaze of the angel. Here, 
in Lippi's enunciation, the book is still open on the Virgin's lap, but she looks over it and focuses on the dove. Similarly, the angel gazes steadily in the Virgin's direction, but is looking, it would seem, towards the dove and beyond it to the book. If we look carefully at the book, we can see through the white paint of the pages, and we notice that the book has actually been painted over the Virgin's blue robe. This might indicate that the artist did not originally intend to depict the book on the Virgin's lap, but included it in a rethink of the composition. The addition of the book here allows for another level of contemplation concerning the conception of Christ that we are witnessing at the centre of this picture. Christ, the second person of the Trinity, was described in John's Gospel as Logos, which the Latin Vulgate Bible translated as verbum or word. And so we read in John that in the beginning was the word and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So here the book can be read as a kind of visual commentary on the idea of the word made flesh. It is placed on the Virgin's lap between the dove and the womb in which Christ is at this very moment about to dwell. Because Christ was Logos, the word, his human body, was sometimes compared in medieval commentary, both textual and visual, to a book, to a repository of words. Therefore, the placement of the book right there on the Virgin's lap, beneath the rays emanating from the dove, could remind the viewer that at this moment, the word is being made flesh. In some pictorial examples of the Annunciation, the quickening of Christ's mortal flesh in the Virgin's womb is evoked by the pages of the Virgin's book flipping and turning in the breeze that has been created by the angel's very recent arrival. In those images, we sometimes see the angel's wings still outstretched and robes all flapping, and the pages of the Virgin's book turn as though they become alive. Well, this is not what we see here. Lippi's Annunciation is a very still version of the theme. This is a painting of action. For Filippo Lippi's Christian viewers, the most important event in the history of the world was taking place right at the centre of the picture. Christ is sending his son to earth. Christ is, in front of our eyes, becoming human. This divine action is the only movement in the painting. The arrival of the angel is complete. He kneels still on the grass. His garments are unmoving and he does not speak. The necessary actions of the angel in making his greeting to the Virgin have taken place. The responses of the Virgin in fearing, questioning and then accepting what the angel had to say have finished. Their interaction is over. All the speech has stilled. And now we see what this moment is really about. Many images of the Annunciation seem just to represent the episode. That is to say that some examples depict the angel and the Virgin together in an interior or a semi-interior space. And that by itself is intended to signify or symbolize the moment of Christ's incarnation. Lippi takes a different approach and really seeks to convey what happened at this event. He imagines the actual moment of the conception of the Christ child. In so doing, he not only presents more detail than is present in the gospel text, but also delves deeper into the text's implications. He invites viewers to contemplate how the angel's words, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, might have been fulfilled. In focusing on the space between the angel and the Virgin, he addresses and fills a tantalizing gap within the text. This painting, in its unusual stillness, slows us down, draws us in, and shows us exactly what we need to know. Thank you, Beth. 
Right, now to set the theological scene, I need to ask you to share my pain for a moment. It's the pain of morning prayer in the Abbey in the weekdays of November. The Abbey is always and forever a delight, obviously, but in the weeks after the Feast of All Saints, our lectionary of readings gives us a rough ride. Our day begins with Daniel and with the book of Revelation, and it's not for the faint hearted. After this, I saw in visions by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring. The same morning that we got that, we heard in Revelation of the fifth angel who opened the shaft of the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. From the smoke came locusts on the earth and they were given authority like the authority of scorpions of the earth. Wandering off after listening to that to look at 15th century art, it's hard not to feel slightly lightweight. Daniel and Revelation are a particular kind of theology called apocalyptic. This is a glimpse of an open heaven. We're looking into mysteries we should really not expect to see. Notice that disruption and violence loom large and so does judgment. The kingdoms of this world are set in stark contrast to the kingdom of God. This is not like that. God's holiness does not sit with our sinfulness. When the future breaks in, it is terrible to behold. Apocalyptic makes God mysterious and it also makes God vivid and alarming. I saw one like the son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. The advent of God will be overwhelming and it will be disruptive. That's what I've been hearing for the last few weeks. I need you to hold that thought now. Hold that important thought that God is not like us and theology is not a tame discipline. Then I need to point out another awkwardness. I'm afraid that we've got so good at Christmas, made it so familiar, that we've pretty well forgotten that there are two Christmas stories, stories not one. You are a little late, but I'm sure you can still order the Amazon Advent calendar that has three very cute shepherds meeting three cuddly looking wise men under a starry sky, all notably observing the rule of six. It's lovely but it never happened. What we do is to assemble a hybrid Christmas in our heads. Without noticing, we conflate two stories, Matthew's Magi and Luke's Shepherds. And we ignore the fact that Matthew and Luke have quite different assumptions. These are stories provided with distinct theological architecture. We miss things if we fail to hold them apart. So tucking away that business of God being very uncomfortable company for a moment, let's turn to St Luke, who is the only evangelist to describe the scene that Lippi paints. Matthew, by the way, does have an annunciation, but it's to Joseph. Lippi is painting St Luke's Gospel, and it's worth asking what St Luke says. So here is a 10 point summary. One, from the outset, Luke tells us that he wrote an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled amongst us. We should notice the structure, because he wants us to, and notice it's all about fulfilment. Then he has the birth of John the Baptist, another angel, and another annunciation. Thirdly, he puts women front and centre. Mary and Elizabeth are in a spotlight. Fourth, this gospel consistently favours the marginalised shepherds, remember, not kings or magi. Mary represents the poor remnant. She declares that God has lifted up the lowly. Fifth, he describes unlikely births. Elizabeth is old. Mary can't understand how this can be. Sixth, he tells us repeatedly that the Holy Spirit is at work. There are lots and lots of references to the Holy Spirit. Seventh, he makes the setting Nazareth, not Bethlehem, which is where Matthew has it. This is an unlooked for place. Nazareth is not on the theological map in the same way that Bethlehem is. 
8th, he frames the story with imperial politics and the Pax Augusta, the Emperor's Peace. 9th, he also offers lots of grand titles that belong to the Emperor, Son of God, God from God, Lord. That's his way of telling us that there are rival claimants to sovereignty. Who is Lord, Luke is asking, and who brings peace? And then 10th, there are in all this what theologians call eschatological expectations. That is, people are talking about the coming day of the Lord. Remember, that language is usually violent and disruptive. Luke knows that violence is all around. So if you were telling the story from Luke, that's what you'd be talking about. You'd be talking about drama, big themes coming together. Fulfillment, remember. He told us it would be all about fulfillment. Luke has us, if you like, in a theological wind tunnel. The future is blowing in like a gale. And there's more than a hint here that tables and chairs might get knocked over. Then there's something rather clever and rather technical. Luke wants us to make connections. Specifically, he wants us to notice direct and deliberate parallels between the enunciation of the birth of the Baptist and of Christ. Here you are, you can see them set out on the screen. On the left, it's the story of John the Baptist's uh, birth, his enunciation. On the right, it's the enunciation uh, to the Virgin Mary. And there are very, very deliberate echoes. The words are very, very similar. And we should also notice right at the end of those two columns that there's also a key contrast. Having set up over and over again the fact that this is very similar, we get a sudden dissociation. At the end of his encounter with the angel, Zechariah could not speak. Mary, however, say the words that we all long to hear. Then we could spot, if we were really paying attention, a further uh, link. It's at the top of this next slide. We're supposed to acknowledge that we've actually heard stories like this before. This is just like the birth narratives in Genesis, where the genealogical line, the generations of Abraham, and therefore the promise that God made that it would all turn out all right, seems destined to fail. It's on the slide that Rachel and Elizabeth use the same words. Uh, God has taken away my reproach. The story in Genesis and in Luke is that the situation's almost hopeless. Elizabeth is old. Uh, it's all on the verge of failure and the human actors in this story are not powerful agents. And then just as you begin to feel that this is getting very clever indeed and that a lie down might be nice, there's another set of parallels this time with the story of 2 Samuel. You can see that at the bottom of this slide. 2 Samuel is all about King David. Luke echoes the language all over again, and this time he makes a link not between John the Baptist and Jesus, but between King David and Jesus. In fact, there's an awful lot of coronation language used in the Annunciation story. King David, King Jesus. What we've got in front of us, if you're reading Luke's Gospel, is a rich and complex story. Luke is telling, amongst the poor and the dispossessed, a king is born. And now, just before we turn back to the picture, a word about virgins and about angels. Luke clearly describes Mary as a virgin. It would take us far too long to sort out what significance Luke wants us to attach to that. But we should be clear that he was not really interested in the bi biology of that claim, the thing that tends to get us so worked up. He was much more excited about the fact that this was a miraculous birth. Not gracious, a virgin gives birth, but a virgin, good heavens, gives birth. Then angels in scripture, well, angels are usually rather alarming figures. Luke changes the language. He gives us Gabriel, an individual with a name. Still, we should be clear that he's describing a shattering moment. And another word theologians use at their sherry parties, it's a theophany. God suddenly breaks in. Remember, it was shattering. Mary and Zechariah were frightened. Mary was troubled. So Luke thinks that the, the Annunciation is full of meaning and it's unsettling. He knows about the wrongness the awkwardness of this moment. 
there are a lot of dislocations. There's brooding background violence. History is crashing around somewhere at the back, waving a sword and shouting like a prophet. Meanwhile, in strides the future, looking very pleased with itself. We're supposed to be rocked back on our heels by all this. Modern commentators sometimes pick up too on the possibility of Mary's shame, an unlooked for pregnancy, or even stress her youth and the unsettling thought that this might be a girl as young as 13. Everyone who writes about Annunciation thinks it should look and feel unsettling. Luke thought it was really startling. Look at the picture. It's not what we see here. Some of Luke's theology is in this picture, but most of it is not. Notice the equivalence of Mary and the angel. This doesn't really feel like theophany, God bursting into the world. The fear and the drama are noticeably missing. Mary isn't poor or powerless in this picture. She has a book and she has fine bedclothes. But nor is this quite a royal setting. It wouldn't appear to be all about the Most High. And there's no sense of the day of the Lord in this picture. No violence, no disruption. What we see here, surely, is calm and tranquil. It's studiedly so. There's not a hint here that when heaven and earth meet, we should be afraid or feel lost or frightened. Lippa suggests that when the Son of the Most High arrives to establish his throne forever, there's not even a murmur of a breeze. What's missing here is that radical otherness that I talked about as I began. The idea that this cannot possibly be like that. There's no awkward collision of the past and the future. There's no sense that God's holiness is foreign to us, frightening, even destructive. Writing about the Annunciation, poets sometimes want us to dwell on the idea that this angel and this girl saw each other. They really saw each other. This is Edwin Muir. See, they've come together. See, while the destroying minutes flow, each reflects the other's face till heaven in hers and earth in his shine steady there. Muir makes it into a trance, a locked gaze, her, him, and Rilke had a similar idea. When he looked and she looked up at him, their looks so merged in one, the world outside grew vacant, just she and he, I, and its pasture. I've seen pictures of the Annunciation that try to give us that steady gaze that the poets describe, I don't think it's what's happening here. This angel and this girl are not having that kind of an encounter. It's not him looking at her, her looking at him. Instead, they both, I think, look at that dove. This is certainly where her eyes are focused. And that makes all the difference. You see, it actually matters that we know that this is not that. Daniel and Revelation are not wrong. They were written at a certain time and made a certain point, but we have to listen to them. It really matters to theologians to be clear that God is not like us. God's holiness, God's life, that's a thing apart. Only when we know that God is not part of creation, not fickle, frail, susceptible to influence like you and me, only then can we hope that God might just be the one to redeem us, to forgive us, get us out of this mess, offer us some hope. This is not that. However, say too much about God's radical holiness, his shattering power, and you arrive all too quickly at a place where God will always come amongst us in anger and in destruction. Who is this that comes from Edom, from Bosra, in garments stained crimson? It is I, announcing vindication, mighty to save. I have trodden the winepress alone. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their juice spattered on my garments and stained all my robes. Lippi shows us something very different indeed. What this picture describes, I think, is not the otherness of God, but God's nearness, God's tender presence. 
This is not an image of what happens when one person sees another, when there's that electric shock of the connection that might be made between me and one different from me. Instead, what we see here is the Holy Spirit filling the space between the angel and the girl. That's what the Holy Spirit is, and that's what the Holy Spirit does, shuttling forever between this and that, and in fact between you and me, bridging all difference. In the love and mercy of God, it is not simply a matter of this and that. There's also always the possibility of what the Holy Spirit can do in between the other thing that is born when heaven and earth meet. Here, the angel and the girl give themselves to that possibility and find their tranquility, peace and indeed redemption. Here in front of us is what might happen if I stop insisting that I must be me and you must be you. If you want to pursue these ideas theologically, they're well explored by John V. Taylor in The Go-Between God, with lots of references to Martin Buber and his great book, I and the Thou. Taylor's book is all about what the Holy Spirit does, and the first chapter, splendidly, is called Annunciation. You have to start there, he says, if you're going to understand. For now, let the, speak, the picture speak over the words of John V. Taylor. This sudden recognition of what is and what might be. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who didst stoop to raise fallen humanity by the childbearing of blessed Mary, Grant that we who have seen thy glory manifested in our flesh and thy love perfected in our weakness may daily be renewed in thine image and know the peace of thy incarnate Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. Huge thanks to both Beth and David for their extraordinarily rich presentations this afternoon. Next Monday, Professor Al Akers of Georgetown and I will be looking at Gitgen Totsin Jan's painting Nativity at Night. Once again, you can register for this seminar, Monday the 7th of December at 1.15, via the Eventbrite link on the Abbey's website. We look forward to welcoming you again. In the meantime, may God bless you and those you love and keep you strong in the hope and joy of this Advent.